We will now proceed with the the second item on the public business, which is the Criminal Law Procedure Amendment Bill 2022, number 21 of 2022. Honorable Minister, Honorable Minister and Attorney General, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise to move that the Criminal Law Procedure Amendment Bill 2022, Bill Number 21 of 2022, published on the 1st of November 2022, be now read a second time. Mr. Speaker, the Criminal Law Procedure Amendment Bill 2022 is inspired by a decision of the Caribbean Court of Justice in the case of Marcus Bisram against the Director of Public Prosecutions, delivered on the 15th of March, 2022. The relevant facts and consequential legal issues which arose in the case are quite simple. Bisram was charged with murder. His preliminary inquiry was concluded by the presiding magistrate at Springlands Magistrate Court within the quarantine magisterial district. At the conclusion of the preliminary inquiry, the learned magistrate found that a prima facie case was not made out against Bisram for him to stand trial before a judge and jury in the high court. As a result, the learned magistrate discharged the accused. Under section 72 of the Criminal Law Procedure Act, the director of public prosecutions is conferred with a number of powers. These include in Terralia, where a magistrate discharges an accused person upon the conclusion of the preliminary inquiry to require that magistrate to send him the deposition taken in the case and any other documents and things connected with the cause, review the same, and if in the opinion of the DPP, that accused person should be committed to stand trial, instruct the magistrate to reopen the preliminary inquiry and commit the accused. Similarly, if the DPP, after reviewing the deposition, is of the view that additional evidence is to be taken and for the accused person to be committed, the DPP is empowered to instruct the magistrate to reopen the PI, take the relevant evidence, and commit the accused to stand trial. The DPP is also empowered to give any such further directions as he may deem fit. A magistrate is bound to carry out all or any directions given to him by the DPP under Section 72. In the Bisram case, in the exercise of the powers conferred by Section 72, the DPP directed the magistrate to reopen the preliminary inquiry and to commit the accused to stand trial before the High Court. Bisram challenged these directions by attacking the constitutionality of Section 72. In a nutshell, the challenge was that Section 72 empowers a non-judicial agency to direct one component of the judiciary on the outcome of a case before the judicial organ. That such a power undermines the independence of the judiciary, abrogates the doctrine of separation of powers, as in, and is in violation of Article 122A of the Constitution of Guyana, which guarantees judicial independence to all courts, as well as 144 of the Constitution, which affords to every citizen protection of the law. Bisram won in the High Court, but lost in the Court of Appeal. He appealed to the Caribbean Court of Justice. The CCJ, our apex court, made the following orders. The CCJ allowed the appeal and ordered a declaration, and I quote, it is hereby declared that Section 72 of the Criminal Law Procedure Act violates the separation of powers and is also inconsistent with Article 122A and Article 144 of the Constitution. 
the CCJ went on to make the following pronouncement, and I quote, until the National Assembly makes suitable provisions, Section 72 is modified to excise those provisions permitting the DPP to direct the magistrate. In lieu thereof, a DPP aggrieved at the discharge of an accused person by a magistrate after the whole of the proceedings at API may apply ex parte to a judge of the Supreme Court for an order that the discharged person be arrested and committed if the judge is of the view that the material placed before the judge justify such a course of action." Unquote. So, Mr. Speaker, the CCJ first declared Section 72 of the Criminal Law Procedure Act to be unconstitutional and then proceeded to modify it in the manner and form that I just outlined. The CCJ being our apex court, our court of final appeal, we are bound to follow the decision in Marcus Bisram and to correct the law in the manner suggested by the, P DP by the CCJ. Mr. Speaker, this amendment seeks to do just that. As explained above, in its current construct, Section 72 provides that where an accused person has been discharged by a magistrate, the DPP, after examining the evidence, may direct the magistrate to reopen the inquiry. This section also requires the magistrate to comply with the directions of the DPP. The CCJ, as I just said, held a Section 72, by which the DPP directs a magistrate to reopen a PI amongst an unlawful fetter on the principle of judicial independence as enshrined in Article 122A of the Constitution. And for completeness of the record, sir, permit me kindly to read Article 122A. It reads, and I quote, all courts and all persons presiding over the courts shall exercise their functions independently of the control and direction of any other person or authority and shall be free and independent from political, executive, and any other form of direction and control, unquote. Mr. Speaker, it is clear that although the DPP is neither part of the political nor the executive regime, the DPP will fall under the linguistic expression of other person or authority, which, who by directing the magistrate, as the DPP did, offended the magistrate's free and independent exercise of powers as enshrined by Article 122A, which I just read. In other words, Mr. Speaker, Section 72 is void to the extent that it makes the magistrate's decision subject to the direction and control of any other person or authority, and in this case, the DPP. The CCJ further held that the language in which 72.3 is drafted, that's where the magistrate shall comply with all directions coming from the DPP, that the mandatory nature of the way that it is drafted is also inconsistent with fair trial principle and the right of the accused to be protected by the law as guaranteed to him as a fundamental right under Article 144. Since the magistrate as a judicial officer is best placed to weigh and determine the evidence that is before him. Mr. Speaker, in the conventional method by which we engage in legislative making on this side of the House, we conducted a consultative process before we came up with the current bill. We consulted the Office of Director of Public Prosecutions. We, constructed, we consulted the Police Legal Advisor and we consulted 
the Bar Association of Guyana, as well as the Barbies Bar Association. These associations and offices were invited to make written submissions, which they did. We then did a first draft of the bill based upon what the CCJ adumbrated and based upon the submissions that we would have received in the consultative engagement. And that draft bill was then circulated to the agencies and offices that were the subject of consultation. When that exercise was completed, Mr. Speaker, we received further inputs and we adjusted the bill accordingly. So we also, Mr. Speaker, in drafting, we consulted similar provisions of the different criminal law procedure law in several countries in the Caribbean, including Jamaica, Trinidad and Tobago, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Dominica, Barbados, and Grenada. Mr. Speaker, having conducted that exercise, our conclusion finds expression in the current amendment. And what the current amendment does, Mr. Speaker, it deletes, and we felt that this was the cleaner way to go. Section 72 of the Principal Act is deleted, and a new section, 72, is substituted. And this new section provides, and if I may quickly read what the section says, Section 72, it says this, Mr. Speaker, very quickly. In every case where a magistrate discharges an accused person under Section 69 or 71A4, the Director of Public Prosecution may make a written request to the magistrate to furnish an authenticated copy of the deposition taken at the preliminary inquiry and every other statement, document, or thing in relation to those proceedings, and the magistrate shall comply with the request. Mr. Speaker, so far, so good. Basically, nothing has been changed. This is the important part. Where the director of public prosecutions, after considering the depositions and any other statement or document or thing furnished by the magistrate under subsection 1, is of the opinion that a prima facie case against a discharged person was established, and the discharged person should have been committed for trial, the DPP shall make an application to a judge of the High Court for a warrant for the arrest and committal for the trial of the discharged person, provided that a judge shall only grant the application of the Director of Public Prosecution, where the judge is satisfied that the evidence as given before the magistrate was sufficient to commit the discharged person for trial. Every application under Section 2 shall be made within three months of the discharged person. So the DPP can't wait until an undue period of time elapses, a man gets his freedom as a result of a court determination, that is a magistrate court determination, and then after a protracted delay, go and make this application to the judge. The DPP is if the DPP is aggrieved by a decision of the magistrate who discharges an accused person at the conclusion of a PI, within three months, the DPP must make this application to a judge in chambers. And as I said, we consulted the DPP to find out whether this is a satisfactory period. And of course, the DPP agreed. I continue, clause four where a judge grants an application for the arrest and committal for trial of a discharged person under subsection 2, the judge shall issue the warrant for the arrest and committal for trial of the discharged person, and that person shall be kept until otherwise discharged in the due course of law or bail may be granted, of course, if bail is granted, or is grantable. So, once the judge hears the application and is satisfied, the power now is removed from the DPP and given to a judge. That is all. And the judge now reviews the deposition and reviews the evidence in support thereof. The judge makes an opinion 
that the magistrate is wrong, that the person should have been committed. The judge makes the order of committal and issues an arrest warrant because the person is out. Would have been discharged by the magistrate. And once that is done, that arrest warrant and that order of committal will contact, con will com the cumulative effect will be that the person will be arrested and um, kept in the public jail. Every person proceeded against under subsection 4 shall be further prosecuted in like manner as if the person has been committed for trial by the magistrate by whom the person was discharged. So everything else proceeds as normal. So that, in essence, is what the bill does in accordance with what the CCJ has ruled. Mr. Speaker, so the bill removes the rep repugnance as found by the CCJ that the DPP directs a magistrate. And a judge now, a judicial organ, as the Constitution allow, is the authority that will now direct the magistrate. And of course, that is permissible. Every day, judges overrule each other, depending upon the hierarchical structure at which they sit, so Court of Appeal directs High Court judges, High Court judges directs magistrates, as the case may be, the Caribbean Court of Justice directs all below it. That's acceptable, but outside of the four corners of the judicial uh, parameters, you can't have an extraneous body giving directions to the judiciary. And that is what the CCJ in, a, in essence found. Mr. Speaker, the CCJ, in its wisdom, and I quoted what the CCJ said, and it said, let me read, briefly reread it again as a modification. The CCJ said in its ruling, when it modified the section, said that the DPP must apply to the judge ex parte. Until the National Assembly makes a suitable provision, Section 72 is modified to excise those provisions, permitting the DPP to direct the magistrate. In lieu thereof, instead thereof, a DPP aggrieved at the discharge of an accused person after the whole of the proceedings at the PI may apply ex parte to a judge of the Supreme Court. Now, the lawyers will, I don't know if they will share my view, but if an accused person is charged with murder, appears before a magistrate and rightly or wrongly is discharged by that magistrate, therefore is free once again. The presumption of innocence has not been dismantled, so he's presumed innocent. He walks a free man. I believe that it would be repugnant to go before a judge ex parte and reinstitute a criminal charge and get an arrest warrant issued against that person and commit him to stand trial before a judge and jury ex parte, meaning without him being heard. I have problems with that. Though the CCJ is saying that it should be done. Here, I believe the CCJ in the recommendation, and I say with the greatest of respect, that they themselves may be guilty of that which they are attempting to regard as preserving and protecting. And that is protection of the law and the rights of an accused person. So in this amendment, you will see that we did not use the word ex parte. The DPP can make the application if the judge wishes to hear the application ex parte, that's a matter for the judge. But if the judge wishes to hear the defense con or hear the man, because here it is you're committing a man to stand trial before a judge and jury, a man who has been acquitted, and one single human being is now reversing that whole process without hearing that person. So we felt, let the judge determine whether he or she should proceed ex parte when the application is made by the DPP. So we did not follow that admonition of the CCG by including the phrase 
ex parte and the application is going to be made and the judge can deal with the matter as the judge deems fit. Then, Mr. Speaker, the amendment also creates a right of appeal. So if the DPP goes there before that judge and is aggrieved by the decision of the judge, let us say that the judge refuses the application to commit, then the DPP is given a right of appeal to the Court of Appeal. Mr. Speaker, we believe that this bill accurately captures the jurisprudential essence of the CCJ's decision and directives, as well as it accords due protection to the constitutional rights of the accused person. Mr. Speaker, the bill also, we have two amendments, which at the appropriate time, I will put before the House. And these two amendments are consequential to Section 72 and consequential to the, the, the pronouncements of the CCJ. Though these sections, 78, is deleted by this amendment, or the amendment to this amendment, it's circulated. And Section 78 contains a similar power in a different circumstance where the DPP can direct a magistrate again. In the event, Section 78 says, that in the event that the DPP is of the view that the magistrate should not have discharged or commit and he should have taken the matter summarily, the magistrate has a power to direct. The DPP has a power to direct the magistrate again. And then section 79 of the Principal Act is also amended to remove another set of powers that the DPP has to direct the magistrate. Now, these provisions were not reviewed by the CCJ, but the essence of what the CCJ has ruled would necessarily infect these provisions with the same repugnant virus that the CCJ found Section 72 was infected with. So rather than wait for the CCJ to sometime in the future rule, we have taken the proactive measure of reviewing the legislation, applying the principles of law enunciated by the CCJ, and by parity of reasoning and logic, we have adjusted the different sections of the legislation, which in our opinion, are going to be similarly affected, having regard to the principles enunciated by the CCJ. So the amendments that are on the white sheet of paper before members, are consequential amendments that ought to bring the gravamen and the, the nucleus of the CCJ's ruling in Bisram properly incorporated in the Criminal Law Procedure Act. Um, the question may arise, why this thing took so long? How it is that Section 72 remained in our books for such a long period of time? and why no other court um, reviewed it and found that it was so patently repugnant as the CCJ did. There is an explanation for that, but I will, if the other side raises it, we can have that discussion, why the CCJ did what they did and why brilliant judges such as J.O.F. Haynes, the Lockus, the Messiahs, the Cranes, in our legal system, why they read this and they never found it to be so elementary offensive. There is a reason why, and there's a big, big debate in the region as to whether the Privy Council has taken one position and the CCJ has taken another. But that's a little outside of the parameters of the debate. But if my friends wishes to raise it on the other side, we can have a healthy exchange on the matter. Mr. Speaker, those are my few comments on the bill and I commend it uh, to the House for passing with the amendments of the appropriate. Thank you, Honorable Attorney General and Minister of Legal Affairs.